All right. So today we're going to learn about the biodiversity equations. Why bother with biodiversity? Well, if you know, it's kind of a hot topic. It's always in the news for some reason. Uh, humans encroach on areas. They cut trees down, build developments. Uh, that displaces wildlife. And then once you displace the wildlife, people are concerned that we have a overall loss of biodiversity. All right. Now, the types of measures vary. We can have some of your basic measures of biodiversity, including like just what, how many species are there, so our species richness. All right. Or you can talk about maybe their distribution, you know, percentages of various species. All right. But those two alone don't really give us a complete picture where we can estimate if diversity is increasing or decreasing. This is where our indices come into play because it takes into account the species that are there, so the number of species that are there, as well as their frequencies or how common or rare those species are. So this lab is all about teaching you how to do these calculations. It's introducing the equations. Next week, we'll get, we're going to use the equations again, but this time we're going to have some simulated communities so you can actually see what various communities would look like. Uh, based on their biodiversity measures and see if we can come up with some some generalizations about when we would prefer certain types of measures over others all right so we're going to start with just these two example habitats all right we've got habitat a and habitat b all right if we just calculate the basic one that everyone thinks of that's number of species or richness how many species do we have in each of these habitats? Ten. ten, right? So for habitat A, richness is ten. We have ten species present. For B, how many species are present? Ten species. All right, so is habitat A and habitat B similar? Yes. In species richness, but if you go out and look at this habitat, would you consider them to be similar? No. Not at all. Why? What does habitat B look like? One species. Just one species dominates, and then occasionally you'll find a different species scattered here and there, right? What about habitat A? Pretty spread out. Okay. So species are evenly distributed. All right, evenly distributed. Would you consider this community homogeneous or heterogeneous? Habitat A. Heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. All right, so heterogeneous is like the uncertainty, the randomness. But if I go in and look at habitats A, they're all just randomly distributed. Yeah, e even though we have a high degree of evenness, meaning even distribution of individuals across the species. When we look at it, it looks very heterogeneous. It looks very mixed and random. And that's different from B. We have a low evenness, all right? Most of the species, most of the individuals are distributed right into a single species, species 10 in this case. But, and, and because of that, when we look at the community, it looks very homogeneous. It looks just all of dominated as one species. All right, so that's our evenness, that's our richness. All right, and you, hopefully you're starting to see that things start getting complicated when we talk about biodiversity. Should we utilize species richness, or should we utilize evenness, or should we utilize something, you know, a mix of the two? All right, so on the fir first page, we did our species richness, and I have a question. What are the benefits of using species richness? And it's used a lot one of the first ones that you learn. What's the benefit of it? Just to see the amount of diversity throughout the entire habitat. OK. How many organisms, how many species are there? Is that necessarily a good thing? So like BioBlitz is coming up, right? Is that Saturday, I think? 
You're going to go out there and you're going to record what species you, you find. What's the advantage of that? Of just using that as, as a diversity metric? Take a stab, Will. I can see you want to answer. It lets you know what's there. And okay, it lets you know what's there. All right. How hard is it to do it? No, it's, yeah, it's pretty simple. You go out and you just tag them. Oh, okay, that's a species. Oh, I've seen that before, seen that. Oh, there's a new one. Let me write it down. Oh, there's a new one. Let me write it down. It's fairly simple. All right, and it does say what kind of species are there. Downside, though, is that it doesn't really give us a, a good idea of the distribution of individuals. All right? You can have a habitat just like this where there's 10 different species, but 91 of those individuals, 91% you know, are all a single species. All right? So because of that, we have uh, two different, actually more, there, there's more diversity measures, but we have two that we're going to talk about. Simpson's index and Shannon's index. Both of these indices take into account the species richness and the distribution of, of individuals across those species. So, in other words, it takes into account both species richness and evenness when it comes up with its diversity measure. In that way, then, we can calculate and compare diversity measures to see which habitat is more diverse. All right? So the first one that we're going to start with is Simpson's index. All right. Simpson's index actually measures dominance. All right. So Simpson's index, piece of chalk, is calculated as Simpson's L, the sum of n sub i times n sub i minus 1 over n times n minus 1. All right, so this is Simpson's index. And it's in your lab handout. What Simpson's index is doing is calculating a probability. It's the probability that you're going to reach into this habitat and pull out two individuals of the same species. Right. So it's a probability. You reach in, pull out two individuals. What's the probability that they're the same species? If we get a high value, and I should say a high value, Simpson's index ranges from 0 to 1 because it's a probability. In reality, it's not going to be from 0 to 1. You're going to have a lower bound because you can't ever get 0. All right? You're, you can't get 0. You can't have 0 individuals at all. All right, So it goes all the way up to 1. The closer it is to 1, that means that if we reach in and pull out two individuals, we have a very high likelihood that both individuals are the same species. A community that might reflect that would be something like this, Habitat B. You've got 91 out of 100 individuals are of one species. If I just randomly go in there and take out two individuals, I have a high likelihood that I get species 10. That's a high Simpson's index of diversity. On Habitat A, we have a lower Simpson's index of diversity because now the likelihood that I draw out two individuals of the same species is much lower. It's not zero. All right? It's not zero. There is a probability of doing that. Uh, but it's going to be lower than Simpson's index for habitat B. So what is this equation? Well, those of you that are in stats or took stats, Bethany, right? should know that our probability of, of an event happening is equal to its frequency. All right? And in this case, we have to have two pulls. We have to pull out one individual. That gives us a species. And then we pull out another individual. And that individual has to be that same species. Those probabilities, we multiply them together, gives us the probability that we have two of the same species. However, we're going to account for the fact that once we draw that first individual, he's out of the population. 
So the top is giving us all the different ways that we could draw two individuals of the same species. So this basically is, the top is accounting for each of the different species. The bottom is how many ways we can get two individuals of the same species. And thus, here's what can happen in our population. This is the total number uh, of, of combinations based on our total number of individuals. That's our Simpsons index. So how do we do it in Excel? I give you a table here, and I give you spots to do it by hand. Now, you can do it by hand, but it takes time. Why do it by hand when we have Excel that will make life a whole lot easier? So if you have your tablet, if you want to fire up your computer, go ahead, get the computers fired up, get Excel or LibreOffice if that's what you use, or Google Sheets if that's what you use. Uh, I'll provide some support for Google Sheets. Usually the functions are, are very similar to Excel. Uh, I, kn I know LibreOffice real well. So we're going to basically use Excel for this entire lab. All right, so Simpson's index is all about dominance. If you have a high dominance, high dominance, we have a large I, or a large L. If we have a low dominance, we'll have a smaller L, low L, all right? But dominance and diversity are inversely related, all right? So as we're waiting for computers to boot up, habitat B has a high degree of dominance, but visually, it's not very diverse. So what we can do is calculate Simpson's index of diversity. Notice the addition of diversity, which is D. And that is simply 1 minus L. So we take our L and we subtract it from 1. And in that way now, our value of D will reflect diversity. The larger the value of D, the more diverse our communities are, the, the more diverse the community. Smaller values of D, less diversity. And diversity and dominance are inversely related. Does that turn on? Oh, well, it's shut down. Shut down. Sorry. All right, so diversity and, and uh, dominance are inversely related. High dominance, low diversity. Low dominance, high diversity. All right, and I put those boxes on the lab handout so that you can kind of keep them straight. So here's our practice, our example table. We're going to use snails. I didn't write them out, but we have Helosoma anceps, Physa gyrina, Pseudosuccinia columella, Gyrolus parvus, and Menetus dilatus. So I've got number of individuals. All right, so number of individuals is usually n, all across the board. All right, even when we do population equations, n is our population size. What we're going to do is separate lowercase and uppercase. So uppercase is your total number of individuals that, that are in our population. All right. Lowercase n with the subscript represents number of individuals of a species. And i is just saying species 1, species 2, species 3, species 4. All right. So here on our table, let's get those centered. I have 75 Helosoma anceps, 70 Physa gyrina, 35 Pseudosuccinia, 15 gyrolis, and 10 Menetus. All right. So... I didn't give you your total sample size. Turn right. But we add them up. And if you remember from our data analysis lab, I can use formula, which is equal sum, hit my parentheses, 
and highlight that column. So this is telling me we're going to calculate the sum of this range. Hit enter, and we've got 205. Pretty easy. Now, what we have to do is calculate this stuff. All right? So what we're doing is we are taking the sum of n times n minus 1. So what we're going to do is, for species 1, take their number, multiply it by the number minus 1, and then go to the next one. Do it for the second species, and the third species, and the fourth species. And then when I'm done, I will add up all of those numbers. So I have my n. What I'm going to do is my n minus 1. So I'm going to hit the equal sign. It's C3 minus 1. So I, hide, I click the cell that, I'm, that I want, and I do minus 1, and hit enter. So it's 74. Now, you could type this out by hand. I like using formulas, because if I have formulas, then if I have a new table, new type of data, all I have to do is just change the numbers, and the table will auto-complete. Right? Right? It will also copy and paste, which is nice. So I've got that. That looks correct. Now, I can go through and write the formula for each of those, but why would I do that? Why not make advantage of the fill function? So notice how my cursor changes. Goes from a thick plus to a thin plus. Once I get that thin plus, I'm going to left click and hold, drag down to fill that formula in our column. And each time, you can see up at the formula bar, it's just going to change the reference. So I've got that. So I've got my n. I have my n minus 1. Now I'm going to multiply across, across the columns because that is the n times n minus 1. So I hit equals c3 times c3. And again, those references are based on my table. Hit enter. 5,550. So, what does this number mean? There are 5,550 ways to randomly draw two individuals of this species from our population. I'm going to do the same thing. So I need this for each species. So once my cursor changes over that lower right square, I'm going to left click and drag down. All right. So now I need the sum of that column. Use my function. This is our numerator. That's our numerator. All right. So we're not done. So what we want to do is calculate our Simpson's index. Our Simpson's index is this. We have our numerator. All right. We don't have our denominator yet, but that's okay because I'm going to use that in a, in a formula. We have n already calculated. So I have a box over here for L. L is equal to, hit equals. So our numerator, that's that value. That's our sum of our n times n minus 1 column. And then I'm going to divide by All right, and I've got my parentheses here because what we want is this value. So that's big N times I'm going to use parentheses again. One more parentheses. And it's this value minus 1. Closed close parentheses. Hit enter. And I get 0.284. So this is Simpson's index. 
This tells me that I had a 28.4% chance of reaching in and pulling out two individuals of the same species from this population. Now you might see this equation as just doing n squared and big N squared. You know, so ignoring that n minus 1. I don't really like it, especially when you have Excel. It's easy to actually do the, the exact equation, calculate the exact probability. Right. But if you're doing it by hand, you can just do the squares. Will this be on the test? This test? No. This will be on the next test. Next test. Exam test. And we'll have to do it by hand? Uh, maybe part of it, where I give you most of it. Yeah. We used to have it on an exam. But a lot of this is understanding the interpretation. How do you interpret it? How do you make the comparison? Because if you need to calculate it by hand, you can always go you can always use Excel. And actually, those of you familiar with R, there's a way I can I can input this table and R will give me the calculations. Will give me Simpsons, will give me Shannon's, give me everything that I want. What was the equation right now? So the equation for L is this up here. So we have the sum. So we have this sum of ni times ni minus 1. All right. So what I'm going to do is do that value. So I hit equals that. Get up here. So that's one cell that's highlighted. And then I'm going to divide it by this value times this value minus 1. And I used references because, again, if I need to work on a new table, I can copy and paste. And if I copy and paste, the formulas stay the same, and then all I, all I have to do is change the numbers. So, for example, let's change it. Let's say we went out another semester, collected it, and we've got 105, 90, 20, 19 and 15. I updated the numbers, everything calculated for me. Super easy. And again, that's really, the focus is really about interpreting, being able to interpret the numbers and explain what these numbers mean. All right, so we've got our Simpsons index. Simpsons index of diversity is lowercase d. That is simply 1 minus that number. And now our diversity is on that scale where it makes sense. Larger values of this D, more diversity that we have. Smaller values, less diversity. I do have effective number of species on here. Uh, we will come back and talk about that. All right, so practice. So we've got our practice problems. Hit pause. All right, so we have our practice problem, and it's fish. Oops, there it is. It's fish. All right, so we say in a small portion of Lake Nazareth, we recorded the number of small fish captured. Here are the data. We're going to answer the questions. So questions are calculate species richness. All right, based on our numbers here, would you say that the community has a high degree of evenness? And then I want you to calculate Simpson's index of diversity. Answer the question, does this community have a high degree of dominance? And then, is this community very heterogeneous? All right. So, I'm going to give you time to do this. Here's your data. Definitely use it on, do it on Excel. And those on the video, I'll pause, and we will come back to review this. All right, so no fill. 
fill. Go fill. All right, so I have my table. Add it up, use my sum to get sum of this column. That's going to give us our big N. We're going to use that in our denominator. Then I have to work on the numerator. So we have our n sub i. That's n sub 1. That's n sub 2. That's n sub 3 and so forth. All right. We're going to do n times n minus 1. To make it easier, I made a column of n minus 1 using formulas or using functions. And then I did my n times n minus 1. So that value times that value gives me that. I filled it. And then I added up or took the sum of this column. All right, so that's our numerator. So then this was, the I put that here. There we go. So you can see it was this value divided by parentheses, this value times this value minus one, and I close parentheses. And that gives us Simpson's index. Simpson's index. Simpson's index of diversity is one minus this. All right. Usually we go to three decimal places. I've left this out up here unrounded so you can see uh, what the values are. All right. So for our questions, what's our species richness? Well, hopefully you have eight. Just counted these up. We have eight different species. They're all present. I don't have any zeros there. Simpson's index, 0.4. All right. Would you say that that's a high degree? Of, uh, let's see here. So that's Simpson's index. We use that to get Simpson's index of diversity. Would you say this has a high degree of dominance? No. Like, tough to say. Almost. Right? It's tough to say in isolation. If it's high degree of dominance, it's tough to say if the community is very heterogeneous or homo homogeneous. All right? It's tough to say in isolation. Based on the numbers, we're kind of at the halfway point, but remember, we're not, we don't ever get to zero for L. We can't ever get to zero, because we can, you know, as soon as we have, uh, you don't ever include a zero up top, or uh, we have zero individuals, you can't divide by that, all right? And you can't really ever have zero as a sum. I mean, you have to have some way to draw out two individuals of the same species. I guess if you have one individual of each species, that's one way to get it, I guess. But I don't know if I'd call that a functioning ecosystem. All right. So just looking at these numbers, would you say we have a high degree of evenness? And for this, I don't think I'd look at these numbers. I mean. You might be able to. I look here. It doesn't look even. No. Not really. Not really. You have a lot of mosquito fish in that sample, right? You know, eight times, seven times that of you know crappie. Know. Close. Um, you've got these four that are all about the same, and then you have a couple that are pretty rare. So. Yeah, I don't know. Again, we need something to compare it to. So this is Simpson's index. Not terribly difficult. All right. Takes into account probability. All right. So probability of finding two individuals of the same species. The second type of diversity measure that we're going to introduce is Shannon's index. All right. Shannon's index measures uncertainty. And it borrows from, from the idea of uh, message entropy or disorder. Right? And this, this is what he kind of based his idea on. His idea is if you have a high degree of uncertainty in an ecosystem or in a habitat, then when you look out, it's kind of hard to predict what the next species will be that you can find or that you can catch. All right. If you have a low degree of uncertainty, then if you find a species, you can probably make a prediction that you're going to find that same species again and again 
and again. So you've got this idea where the uncertainty itself, the amount of uncertainty, could be directly related to the amount of biodiversity that we have. Likewise, this is a very direct comparison to heterogeneity. So if you have a large amount of uncertainty, you have a large degree of, of heterogeneity, and thus a large degree of our Shannon's index. All right? So with the Shannon's index, instead of using raw counts, we now use proportions. All right? And there's an advantage to that. And I had alluded to it before. All right? So our Shannon's index, H, is equal to the negative of the sum p sub i times the natural log of p sub i, where p sub i is n sub i over our total population size. So p sub i is a proportion. So instead of working with raw numbers, we're going to look at proportions of individuals. The advantage of this is that we basically take out total population size. We standardize our numbers against the total number of individuals in our population. As I was alluding to, if you have one individual in our habitat, that individual basically drops out. It loses contribution to Simpson's index. That zero, there's one individual there, but it doesn't contribute anything to the, the, um, the diversity measure. That's not so with Shannon's index. Because we're using proportions, every individual is going to contribute to it. So in many ways, the, these rarer species or these less common species will start to contribute more to the diversity measure than the common species. All right, so we're, we're kind of applying a weighting system to allow Shannons to capture the rare species or allow them to have a little bit more significance than what they would have in Simpson's index. All right, so I give you the equation here. It's negative of the sum. Why the negative? It's because when we take a natural log proportion, that is going to be a negative number. So our proportion is going to range from 0 to 1. Anytime you work with a decimal, log is going to be negative. So when you add up, when you add up the sum, you get a negative value. We don't really want to work with negatives, so we'll cancel them out to get to a positive value. All right. So let's go through how to do this. Here's our practice table. This time we have oak trees. All right. Or oak trees. We have tree species, all right, in a habitat, and we counted the number of individuals. Pretty easy to do for trees, as long as you can identify them. All right. So here's our data table. So like before, I have all of our individuals for each species, and I went ahead and calculated the sum of that table. All right. So in this habitat, we have 725 individuals. We need this to calculate our proportion. So our proportion is this number, so like the proportion of oak is the number of oaks divided by the total number of trees in our habitat. The pecan, the number of pecans divided by total number of individuals. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these values and divide by this one value. So I can write a formula equals the number of oaks divided by total number of trees in our habitat. And when I hit enter, I can see that oaks constitute 34.5% of all trees in our habitat. So I have that proportion. Now, if I drag and fill this in, you're going to see this happen. And it's because when we fill it in, the references are updated. That one's updated. That one's updated. That one's updated. That one's updated. 
So each of these values get updated, but this one does as well. So as soon as we go down to the next row, it uses this, and then that, that one, and then that one, and then that one. Is there a way to prevent Excel from doing that? Yes, there is. This is a hard reference. So I don't want that number to change. So I'm going to use the dollar sign before that number. I'm going to use the dollar sign before that number. If I use the dollar sign before the letter, then the letter won't change. So that dollar sign is going to be a hard reference to that cell, and that cell won't change. Does it change the calculation? No, I still get the same 34.5%. But now when I drag and fill it down, now I get all the numbers because, as you'll see, the C9 remains... C9 for each of our rows. So that's a pretty cool trick. All right, so here's our proportions. Now remember, we're, we're trying to get our Shannon's index equation. All right, so we have our proportions. Now we need our, our log, our natural log. And Excel has a natural log function, ln. So I'm going to do ln parentheses, and we want the natural log of that proportion that we calculated. So I clicked on it, hit enter, and I get negative 1.064. Does that sound right? Yep, it's a negative. We're taking a natural log of decimal, it's a negative. All right, so I, I fill that in. No need to use a hard reference on this one. We already have our proportions. So we have those. And now we need, so we have our, P, our, natural, our, our proportion, our P. We have our natural log of P. Now we have to multiply across the row to, to get this P times our natural log of P value. Should we get a negative? Yep. Yeah, we should. So I get 0.367. And then I'm going to drag and fill down the column. All right, so now I've done this P times natural log of P for each species. Now I need to take the sum. So I'm going to take the sum of that entire column, and I get negative 1.58764. Should it be negative? Yeah, we're dealing with all with negatives. So this isn't Shannon's index yet. This is actually the negative of Shannon's index. So what we want is the positive value. How do we get the positive value? Well, I can do negative 1 times that. Whoops. I guess we'll, we'll talk about evenness here. Or ABS for absolute value. That'll work because we're working in a positive. That's the Shane incident. Now, Shannon's index ranges from 0 all the way up to, in theory, infinity. I don't think you'll ever get to infinity. I think most of, most of the values tend to be in this, like, 1 to maybe 3 or 4. You might go up to 5 to 10, depending on what type of uh, habitat, sample sizes, and, and that sort of thing. All right? But we have uh, Shannon's index. Now, again... Both Simpsons and Shannons takes into account richness and evenness. But these numbers alone don't really tell us anything about the evenness itself. We can increase the number of species in our habitat and cause an increase in, in Shannons index and Simpsons index. If we decrease the number of species, we can decrease those values. If we change the evenness, 
So if we make habitats more even, or the distribution more even, we should increase this value. If we make it less even, we should decrease that value. So is there a way to calculate evenness? Yeah, there is. How do we calculate evenness? Using Shannon's index, all right? So Shannon's index, using Shannon's index, we can calculate evenness. Can we do it with uh, Simpsons? No, we can't. So if we ask for evenness, you know you need to use H. So evenness, E, is H, Shannon's index, divided by the natural log of our species richness. All right. Now, let's go over some things. What this is doing is calculating a more of a proportion of the maximum value of our Simpson or our Shannon's index that we could possibly get. So our natural log of S, natural log of our species, which is here, gives us the largest value of H that we can get if all of our individuals are evenly distributed across species. So at 100% evenness, all right, we should at 100% evenness, we should have the natural log of species richness as our Shannon's index. And that's what this is. We have natural log of 6, because that's how many species we have. All right. The maximum value of a Shannon's index that we can get is 1.79. We didn't get that value. But we can use that maximum value to estimate what our evenness actually is, or percentage of 100% evenness. So what we do with our evenness is take our Shannon's index, or yeah, Shannon's index, 1.587, and we divide it by that maximum value. And here we get 0.886. This is our evenness value. It says that we are basically 88 almost 89% of our maximum value. Now, that doesn't really tell us a whole lot in isolation. I mean, you do a calculation and you get 0.89. That seems like a high evenness, but so does 0.75. That seems high. So does 0.6. That seems high. All right. So the number itself doesn't really mean a whole lot until we start comparing it to other communities. And then once we compare evenness, we could say, oh yeah, this one's definitely has higher evenness than this other habitat. And now that becomes meaningful. All right, because here you can look at this. At 89% of the maximum, does that reflect like even distribution of individuals across the species? Not really. But at least this, this evenness value gives us a way to quantify how even we are. All right. Questions? All right, so we have practice problem two to work on. All right, so practice problem two is uh, mosquitoes. So here's our distribution. All right, we've got 835 individuals. So assume we went out with a mosquito trap, a CO2 trap. We caught mosquitoes over multiple nights in a week. And this is the breakdown of uh, the species, five different species. Well, two species, and then we just recorded uh, genre. What I want you to do is go through, calculate your Shannon's index and evenness. All right, so here are my numbers. 
at 1.15838. Evenness is 0.719. <clears throat> so, again, the evenness in isolation doesn't really give us a clear image of what, what like overall evenness is because I look at this and I could say, well, geez, it looks like we have two species really dominate, Aedes albopictus and, and Culex species. All right? I'm not sure if I'd necessarily call this highly even, I wouldn't, I wouldn't also say that it's a highly dominant species. So you know, in isolation, the number is a little bit meaningless, but compared to the previous one, we could say that it's less even than our oak community, or our oak, our tree community. All right, and again, the maximum Shannon's index that we could get, that's the natural log of our richness, so the, the highest value that we could get is 1.6 just based on the number of species that we have here. All right. All right. Any questions? Pause. All right, so what we, we're interested in doing is comparing. All right, comparing habitats. And while we can look at the numbers, and make the claim that one is more diverse than, than another habitat, all right? We often want to know that next question, which would be, well, how much more diverse is it? All right, so take these two situations. We've got, uh, what did I measure? We recorded weed diversity across campus. All right, weed diversity across campus. And we have uh, Shannon's index here, in that row, we have uh, you know, Shan Simpson's index up here, Shannon's index here. All right, so we can look at it, and we, and we could we can make claims as to which side is more diverse. So which side is more diverse? East or west? East. East. How do you know? So Shannon's has a high degree of uncertainty. Yep. So, yeah. Yep, yeah, so Shannon's, you know, just a straight comparison. The larger the Shannon's value, the more diversity you have there. All right. We don't know if it's richness or evenness, but we know it's just there's more diversity there. Uh, Simpson's is inverse. So the lower the value, the more diversity we have, which is kind of an important thing since if we're working with the L. All right. The problem, though, comes when we try to talk about how much more diverse one place is from the other. Both of these. Simpsons and Shannons is not on a linear scale. So there's no clear way to make a comparison. So right here, you know, 0 0.8 versus 0 0.12, what's that difference? Maybe 150%, all right? But that only applies that 150% comparison or say, oh, it's 150% more diverse. Or 50%, yeah, 150, no, 50% more diverse. 50% more diverse, all right? If it's 50% more diverse, only applies on values that are on a linear scale. So think of straight line. If you compare the numbers 2 to 4, 4 is twice as large as 2, right? All right, 4 versus 8. 8 is twice as large as, as 4, all right? Makes, that's on a linear scale. But if we did something like e to the 2 and e to the 4, well, e to the 4 is not twice as large as e to the, e to the 2, all right? Because we're not on a linear scale at that point. And that's what these are. They're not on a linear scale. So how do we get these on, on a linear scale? We do so by converting these numbers to something called the effective number of species. Now, the effective number of species is for Shannon's index. The equivalent term is true diversity. First, well, effective number of species is for Shannon's index. True diversity is for Simpson's index. Man, these, these are just going back and forth, going back and forth. All right? So I'm going to start with Shannon since that's what we did. So our effective number of species.
is e to the h. And that's kind of how we abbreviate, e to the h. e is our exponent, exponential, and h is our Shannon's index. Our true diversity is for Simpsons. Our true diversity is, uh, true diversity actually has capital D is our, is our letter for that. That is 1 over L. So it's the inverse. Now what are these? What's true diversity? What's the effective number of species? These numbers tell us that based on our value for Simpson's index or our value for Shannon's index, if we had 100% even community, the effective number of species is how many species we would actually expect to see. All right. So now, if we convert these indices to number of species that we expect to see based on these numbers, now we're on a linear scale. Now, 2 versus 4 becomes twice as large. 2 versus 6, three times as large. All right. So now we can start doing things like that. All right, once we have these, this true diversity or the effective number of species, we're on our linear scale, and then we can start to calculate percent change. All right, so percent change is a pretty simple equation. All right, so percentage change, actually, I'll do this. Who knows it? Where'd you learn that? I actually took stats. Hey, took stats? Cool. During the summer, I failed. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I learned this in chemistry. And that's, like, what, I was afraid that when I say, oh, yeah, percent change, people will start having nightmares and say, oh, no, chemistry. But that's our, that's our percentage change. So this applies when we, when we work on a linear scale. All right, and now this will give us like how much more diverse something is. So we have our east and our west values. All right, east and our west west quads. So what we can do, let's delete those because we'll calculate them, is calculate our effective number of species. So I give you this table. Do you have a question? No? All right, so we have our, I'm going to start with Simpsons. Effective number of species. Of species for Simpsons is simply one divided by our value. So for a Simpsons index of 0.34, if we're 100% even, we expect to see 2.94 species. That's what we expect to see. That fill function works sideways too. I can drag and fill to the right. So for this value, 0.48, if individuals are evenly distributed among species, we expect to see 2.08 species. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. We said east is more, dis more diverse. All right. If we hold evenness con constant, then diversity will increase when we add more species. So just by this fact alone, we said East was more diverse. We expected East to have more, more species, have a higher true diversity. And it is. All right, so now our percentage change is our final minus initial. Now, that's for our percentage change. For this, we are, we're always going to ask how much more diverse is something. So what I like to do is use the larger value minus a smaller value divided by our larger value. Uh, no, larger minus the smaller divided by the smaller. So I'm going to use parentheses, my larger value minus my smaller value divided by my smaller value. And I'll multiply by 100 so that we get a percent. So 41.2%. So east quad, according to Simpson's index, is 41.2% more diverse 
than the west quad. And that's different than if we did this, if we tried to use this measure, we wouldn't get that 41.2. So I'm going to change this. So this is larger minus smaller divided by smaller times 100. All right, so that's for, for Simpsons. What about for Shannons? Well, we need our effective number of species. What's our effective number of species? E to the H. How do we get E to the H? EXP. That's our function. Click on that. The so EXP of our Shannon's index, 3.455. And 2.20. So again, I just build it across. Does it make sense? Yes, again. Again, we said East is more diverse, so we expect it to have a higher number of effective no, a higher number of a higher effective number of species, larger effective number of species. What's our percentage change? Our larger minus the smaller ones, Lar larger minus smaller, divided by our small value times 100, 56.8. So according to Shannon's index, the East Quad is 56.8% more diverse than the West Quad. We already know East was more diverse. But the, this percentage change allows us to assign a numeric value of how much more diverse it actually is. We could say, well, it has approximately 1.5 more species. Right? But that assumes, that assumes an even distribution. And that's why we use that. But that, that allows us to get to that linear scale. All right, not too bad. All right, so we did these percentages. These last three questions. Does it matter which index we use to compare biodiversity values? So if we have two different habitats like this, east versus west, does it matter if we use Simpsons or Shannon, or it doesn't matter which index we use. Yeah, so Simpsons or Shannon's. Do you think it matters? No. All right, Anthony says no. Why not? Oh, uh, because it should both give you the same values. Same trends? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, so it should, they should both reflect the underlying distribution of species. All right, what were you going to say? I like Shannon's more. You like Shannon's more, why? Because of the proportions. OK. Um, each species counts for more. So I feel like it's just a little more um, like general of the entire, instead of strictly counting out a species. OK, I'll take it. All right, so number two, or second question. Which factors might influence our choice of diversity index? Rare species. What's that? A rare species. OK. Maybe if you have rare species. How, how many rare species? species? One. OK, just one? Or two. Or two. All right, so maybe com what is it, commonness, commonality, or rareness. OK. Do these measures quantify the distribution of species? So do Simpsons and Shannon's quantify the distribution? Shannon's does type portion breakdown. Okay. What about Simpsons?
What about Simpsons? I'll agree with Shannon's. What about Simpsons? Who says yes? No, Michael says no. Who agrees with Michael? All right, we got at least one. Who disagrees with him and votes yes? Who has no eye clue? No clue. Hey, good, good volunteer. So, does it do it 100%? No. But both of them do. Both of them take into account this distribution because the more individuals that you have here, the more combinations you're going to get for that species. The fewer individuals, the fewer combinations. So through the probability, through this probability formula, it does take into account that evenness value. And, and, but it also takes into, into account our richness. That's why we use the indices. It takes into account both of those things. All right. Now, these other two questions that we answered, those are the focus of next week's lab. Now we'll start to see who's right. Is Anthony right that we should use Simpsons? Is Michael right that we should use Shannon's? You know, are there certain situations when we would favor one over the other or are both just equally good? All right. So I didn't I purposely didn't give you answers to those. But other than that third one. Simpsons and Shannons take into account both species richness and evenness. Both of them do it. All right. All right. So you have this last page to do.